I said, I was very busy this summer, and I said, uh, I can't go to another lecture. I was just in Dublin. I flew uh, like today. I have to fly back tomorrow. And I said, okay, if I can meet Caesar for five minutes, <laughs> I'm coming. I'm going to give the talk if I can meet Caesar for five minutes. And they said, okay. And then we spent one hour talking and telling stories. And I remember that uh, years ago, and I think it was 1995, when this building just opened, he sent, Caesar sent me a poster about the drawings of this building signed, which I still cherish in my, my collection of, but I mean, really, this is so embarrassing. I mean, the greatest living architect on the planet is sitting here and I have to say something. <laughs> and I, I tell my students, you know, what's an example for architecture today? I don't think we're living in a time uh, that is very helpful for students because they don't have a good model about what is uh, a, an office. And somehow they have an office of 100 or 200 and even the magazine, Global Architecture, now prints some silly thing about how many people work in your office that has nothing to do with architecture. I was in Lou Kahn's office. Uh, I was hired, and I, I didn't get to work there because he died, but at the most busy time of his life, he had 16 people. When the um, Institute for Adma Advanced Study was going on in, in India and uh, Bangladesh was going on, he had more work than he'd ever had in his whole life, 16 people. Lou, uh, Le Corbusier, my good friend um, jo Jose Uberi, who was there, knows there was only six people at the end of his life. Um, so this idea of the big office is something we have to counter as teachers. And I think also this is great to be here because this school being done by an architect, that's also a rare thing. I mean, it's a beautiful complex of buildings, the way the spaces work, you know, the idea that you're merging with the land. I mean, there's so many important, let's say, lessons of proportion that are right here. So part of the excitement of being here, and look at this incredible crowd, is that it's Caesar's building and Caesar's here. I, I, I can't believe it. I mean, in, in a certain sense, I feel embarrassed to give this talk, actually. In fact, I'm going to cut it short. Maybe we have questions. We have some dialogue or something instead of me. Because this is a book. This lecture, oops, how do we start? This lecture is part of a book I'm writing. So, um, in fact, I think you can get it online. It was first given um, September 25th at the Salk Institute. That's why I start with a quote of Lou Kahn. Architecture does not exist. What exists is the spirit of architecture. And basically, the book is organized into the thinking and to the making, which are the projects. They're shown very cryptically, not in detail. So there are these chapters, and I'm just going to kind of try to you know, speak about them um, in, in general, not, not go into great detail. And that's the, that's the working title, but it's a little bit of a mouthful, so I'm, I might change the title of this book to Compression. And it's going to be published by Princeton Architectural Press. I have to turn in all the material by September 1st. So the inspiration was really from a great neuroscientist, Eric Kandel. And when I was presenting my talk, he was presenting a talk about reductionism in art and brain science. It's a beautiful book. It's a tiny book. You can read it in an airplane flight. And it and argues for the opposite of the, the kind of thinking that makes abstraction central to the way we think. Rather than giving someone a literal image of things, you know, sort of what postmodern did to architecture, that abstraction is, 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 is central to the way the brain works. This thing is on a kind of delay, I guess. So I'm not going to go into this part of the talk. I will just say that when I made my talk, at the, the Salk Institute, I made this drawing, and I was in Santorini. Actually, it was my, my wedding to my Greek wife, who's also an architect. 
And I made this drawing, Santorini, if you've ever been there, it's like a beautiful blue ocean and this white buildings carved into the, le into the side of the hill. And this idea of the environment is part of our, our brain. It's part of our body. So the environment influences our body. And certainly this is a great environment. And then our body has the brain working t together with it. But there's a thing called the mind, which I dot, a dotted line around the mind. That's, this is the, 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 the immeasurable part. And this is the central part for me, for architecture. This uh, also is an argument that kind of fulfills Churchill's First, we shape our buildings there after they shape us. The importance of architecture is enormous. And I think th that you could argue it on a no neurobiological level now, um, well partially because of the science, brain science has made so many advances. We can actually see what happens when we experience certain environments. The great, this is a young man that I met, um, Siddhartha Mukherjee's book, The Gene, it even has proof that there's an, a, a passing on of environments from one, bio, uh, one person to another. It's called the epigenetics. That is, if you grow up in a very troubled environment, you can actually pass the trouble on to your, your children. So epigenetics is another, uh, another discipline which I, I don't really know much about, but I do recommend this important book. And I've worked with a protein folding uh, uh, for D.E. Shaw in New York, where we tried to make the architecture parallel to some of the things that they were doing in, 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 in their science. <sighs> Analogical thinking. To me, a building you know, really must, be, must have an idea that drives the design. And curiosity, imagination, and enthusiasm really are all behind the creative act. And this is a, di a di diagram of what I think happens. You know, we have a concept that's driving a design, and then, like in the building chiasma, intertwining, it gets realized. But th what the really important thing is the space and the light of the building itself, not the concept that's driving the design. And then, sort of, most of the projects don't cross this logical, logically unbridgeable gap. So, just a few concept sketches that turn into a building. This is Chiasma. This is a building that launched my career. It was a competition, 416 entries, um, and we won it. And I, it was just this simple idea of the intertwining. It's, those are the concept, uh, the, the competition drawings. That's the building, now 20 years old. And I just made a celebration on the 31st of May, 2018. I made some postcards for the museum to celebrate the 20th anniversary. This is the concept drawing for the Nelson Atkins, where we broke the rules. Instead of adding on to the north, we went into the landscape. And I, I, w I made this idea of the stone and the feather, the heavy and the light. And I found in their stone facade, when I was presenting the competition, I said, I'm sorry, I broke the rules. But I found the courage uh, written in stone in your facade from the 1933 building. It says, the soul has greater need of the ideal than of the real. That's from the competition. Another chapter is on light. Um, someone asked me, what's your favorite material that you like to use? Light. And it's free. I mean, but now natural light, more than ever, we realize that it affects our health. It affects our psychology. It affects our well-being. Light is the main thing. Light is a natural phenomenon, the complexity of, of which reveals the structure of human consciousness. Objects, including buildings with their absorption and reflection of light, stimulate the human brain's neural networks, in effect, activating the brain. The more complex and nuanced the stimulation, the more fully the brain comes to life. My good friend, Lebius Woods, the year that he died, wrote that, and I, I'm going to put it in the book. I live behind the Pantheon in Rome, I mean, I came from a, a very tiny place, Bremerton, Washington. There's not even an architect in Bremerton, Washington. There's only 30, 29,000 people, and they used to build battleships. So, you know, it was a terrible place to kind of be 
and try to be an architect. And I went to 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 uh, the University of Washington. That wasn't very interesting either. That's nowhere is near this school where you have an actual building and great greatest architect on the planet. I mean, this is a place to study architecture, not the University of Washington. In fact, they're so pragmatic, they changed the name of the School of Architecture to the College of the Built Environment. What the hell is that about? Stupid. Anyway, that's where I came from. But what changed me? I went to Rome. That's where I grew up, right there. Terrible. You know, That was my first house, uh, 1974. And it was built for my parents, and it's still there. They passed, but it's still there, and we still have a cabin. So I go back to my roots, but I, I'm glad I left. This is the first building that I did realize in Seattle, the Chapel of St. Ignatius, I'm very proud of, also 20 years old. That's the concept drawing, seven bottles of light in a stone box. They keep it up very well. This is a, a beautiful 6,000 square foot building, and uh, it's about the spiritual exercises, so the seven bottles have contrasting colors. So when if you look at a red square and you stare at a white wall, you see a green square. You know that phenomena of contrasting colors. And it's, a, it's a brain activity. It's a neural activity. And that was at the center of the concept of the seven bottles. And I'm really happy to tell you that the university gets it. And even on their website, they tell you about the story of the building. So having an idea that drives the design helps you make your decisions, but later on it can add a dimension of, of meaning to the building that somehow takes on its own life. In, in Hamaroy, Norway, north of the Arctic Circle, we were asked to do a museum for Knut Hamsen. Knut Hamsen was one of the most co controversial Norwegian writers. Um, he was a surrealist in a way. Uh, his book, uh, 1899 book, Hunger, influenced the surrealist movement in Paris. But he was a controversial figure. And there's the building realized after 12 years. We designed it in 1996, and it opened in 2012. And I, they said when we were going into construction, don't you want to change anything? I said, no. It's based on the building as a body with invisible forces. It's, that was a, a, a text from Newt, Newt Hampton. And my, my theory of architecture is every site and circumstance deserves the idea that drives the design. It has nothing to do with the current styles or styles. And there's the natural light that comes in. And in, the, in this climate, the far north, the sun goes down around 17th of December and doesn't come up until February 5th, so dark all winter. But they, they say, oh, you must come. It's very beautiful, a soft white light on the snow. But it wasn't an easy building. <laughs> this is a, uh, yeah. There were some, th I think there were like 300 newspaper articles trying to stop this project. Um, and I won't go into why, but they even built a beer tap in one of the taverns and served beer out of the model of the building. And at a certain point, it had been in the newspaper so many times that a teacher sent her children out to go and sketch farm buildings, vernacular buildings in Norway, in, in, a, in, a, in the vicinity of the school, and they all came back with sketches of the Newt Homsen Center, because it had been in the newspaper all the time. This is a competition in Herning, Denmark, that we won. Also about natural light, billowing light, this idea of light being almost like underneath a sail that it, that it comes in, and it's inspired by Piero Manzoni's work. They have the largest collection of Piero Manzoni. This is the Glasgow School of Art. Macintosh's great building had such wonderful light, and that was what we were studying. How could we bring this new building to be related to the Macintosh building? And it was an analysis of natural light and, and, a, and a circuit, a browsing circuit that connects all parts of the building. These, these tubes of light are also the structure holding up, holding up the building and, and ventilating it, so it's a super energetic, energy conscious building. And it's a tragedy that last month, again, the, the Macintosh building has, has burned. But the, the director, Tom Inns, assures us it will be rebuilt.
the, there's insurance money this time. It will be rebuilt. This is the Princeton Lewis Center for Architecture, uh, uh, Lewis Center for the Arts, Dance, Music, and Poetry. Each piece has another idea driving the design. For example, in music, the individual practice rooms are suspended over the collective. That's the structure in concrete. There you see it at night. It's the entrance to the campus. There's a, a forum below this pond with these large skylights bringing rippled light. You have to visit this. It's, it's, it's and this is the kind of social space, the social condenser space that brings all the different arts together. That's all bathed in a kind of rippling light from the water. That reminds me of my home, Seattle, full of seagulls. And when they poop on your shoulder, it's good luck. <laughs> There's the idea, the, the, the collective orchestral practice room and the individual on suspended boxes above. And you can see them, they're hanging on rods. That was an acoustical separation between the practice rooms. But because the, the glass walls were also in tension, like, a like an instrument, and you can see right through the building. School of Architecture at Pratt, also 20 years old. Natural light is mixed at the top, north light and south light, cool and warm. This is a house we just finished. I, th I think working on small projects is more exciting sometimes than working on a large project. This project is 918 square feet. And there you can see the way the light is working on the interior. You can visit this house. It's part of our program at T2 Reserve in Rhinebeck, New York. You can look it up. Look up T-Space, Rhinebeck, Dutchess County, and you'll see the whole program. We have a teaching program. We actually have a summer school going on right now. That's why I have to fly back. Five students, though, that's all we have. And they have four weeks. You have 200 students in one week. When I was a student, they, the professors asked me to make a cube that could do everything. You could le sleep, work, work on your drafting board, cook. And I said, I can't do that. I can't. It doesn't work for me. And I, m I made a drawing, and this is a recreation of it. I said, what's missing is all the subjective. That's the University of Washington that, that changed the, the name to the College of the Built Environment. I think they still run this cube problem. But anyway, I said, no, it's got to have this other dimension, psychological space. And that was a chapter in my book, Urbanisms, which is the last book I did. This new book, Compression, is going to be in this same series. But we know, I think we know more about psychological space now, especially with n neuroscience making advances. And this is a chapter I might not include. Um, it's called Negative Capability, and it has to do with the time that we live in today. And I'm, I don't even need to tell you about the problems of ignorance in high places, because I come from a country where there's never been more ignorance in the highest place. But I go back to a little story um, which, which took place when the poets Yeats and Rilke were walking home after a poetry reading. The topic was the future, the way forward. They argued over an hour and came up with the term negative capability. This is briefly to take all the negative aspects of the civilization around us and gather them inside oneself within, with the spirit and still make a creative contribution. And, and Kenneth Rexroth, a great poet, said it in one sentence. Against the ruin of the world, there's only one defense, the creative act. So I organize a few of the recent projects under the term social condensers. That is that the building, like this is a social condenser space. This is a beautiful example of where a piece of architecture answers to the program, but there's something else that it gives back, like this space. Look at this. This is a perfect example of what, what I'm trying to speak about in these buildings. And just quickly, 
these are the these are the idea that 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 you would provide space open to everyone. You would give spatial energy. You would excite the potential creativity and interaction via the architecture. You would aim to carry this interactive energy beyond the site to the campus and to the streets. And you would do this with the greatest environmental responsibility. And so this is a little project that I'm super proud of that's going to open soon. There you see uh, the United Nations building on the left, Lou Kahn's only building the FDR memorial in our little library. And there it is sitting, this little tiny community library sitting at the base of these you know, developer condominium towers. And I should say that this building only comes about because of political will. Because one of those developers that build those towers offered the library the bottom two floors if they could build a tower of condominiums on the site. And the, and the, and the congressman, Jimmy Van Brander, said, no, we want a building. We want the expression of a library. And that's the social space that connects all the, all the functions of the library. This was the concept, the idea that there's this zigzag of movement that you see Manhattan in the distance. This could have been built as a one-story building, but we said, no, we want to be able to have this great view, and the building needs to have a, f a presence as a public work. So as you go up, you see the incredible views of Manhattan. And then it's a balance of the digital and the book. So when you look, when you come into the space, you look up and you see all these books. But behind every one is a long desk, not unlike Caesar's table here, where people can put their computers. So there's a balance between the digital and the book. And I think in the future, the books will never disappear. That's my opinion. And, and I've, I have a great friend, uh, William Stout, uh, in San Francisco, has a great bookstore. He survived. It's the greatest architectural bookstore in, in America. And he survived. He said things are changing, that we will not you know, be all uh, on Arch Daily forever. We will have books. And this is very exciting. It's much farther along now. It's going to open. Please come and visit. It's a public space. It has a great cafe on the roof. Um, it's, that's all the structure. Uh, with the, with the so there's no columns. The building is only 40 feet wide. So you're looking at the structure, and you're looking at the form, and you're looking at that movement of the stairs that move up on the inside. And that's the children's library on the rest. And, and if you look at the other elevation, there's three openings that tell you that it's for children, adults, and teenagers, the three, the three uh, clients. This is the Institute of Advanced Studies in Princeton. This was a competition against Oma, Dilra Scafidio, uh, Todd Williams, and Billy Tsen. I did 17 competitions in the last two years, but we won three of them. That's, that's a lot of work, uh, but this one is under construction. And the idea was really about intertwining with the landscape and intertwining with space and light. And these are just some studies. But this notion of a space curve, which is a little bit like Einstein's thinking. When two curves come together, two curved surfaces, they create a curve that's called a space curve. And there are five of them in this building. And the uh, director, when we won, he said, oh, those, those ceilings, those billowing ceilings, that's a place for our thought balloons. And there you see the, the five space curves in plan, some renderings that are required these days. These computer drawing renderings are required. I, I love the, the period when we could just do models and hand drawings, but now it's, it's, this is the world we inhabit, we have to do it. And then they get so realistic, they look like the building is built already, but it's not. It's under construction, however. And I had to check this with everybody involved, and I checked with Einstein, and he was visiting uh, Le Corbusier at the time, and they all agreed it's okay to go forward. This is the, the another competition. The the extension of the Kennedy Center, which hadn't been s extended since 1972. So um, we, we had the idea of making pavilions. Now the thing is going on by itself. That's interesting. So it's a very important site because you can see the Lincoln Memorial, the Washington Memorial, 
the, the river, the Roosevelt Island, and so the three yellow pavilions are all connected below, and that's really what the concept is, and creates an, a public space, which is a kind of social condenser space, because while the opera costs $250 a seat, you can see it for free outside. It's simulcast, like with this LD LED technology, outside, simulcast. And finally, they got the white concrete right. They had to do several. It's very hard to, and then the spaces all get natural light. The original building didn't have windows. The Edward Duro Stone Building is a very huge building, a thousand feet by three hundred feet, no windows, and ours, ours is all about natural light. So we ripple the landscape, bring the bring the natural light in. So this is going to open in a year, September eighth, two thousand nineteen. And I had a preview there uh, two weeks ago, and we had 300 journalists, press people, and this is Washington, D.C., and we talked about Kennedy and all the things that he stood for, and I, I made quotes about Kennedy and the arts, and we never mentioned anything at all about the current White House. And I think everybody was there because they're so excited to think of a great leader like JFK. So it's all in white concrete. Probably this is my most CESA-inspired uh, building that I ever did. And they wanted it, in, no, the competition was in white marble. And then we couldn't afford it, and we had to VE this, and then I convinced them to do white concrete. And then when I was, they took out the canopy, and then I said, well, we have to have a canopy at the entrance pavilion. And when, made, when I sketched this, I thought, it's Caesar, but I love him so much, I'm just going to do it because it's great, you know. He's a great inspiration. So uh, whenever you go there and you go to the entrance, uh, at the entrance building, you can look at a Caesar canopy right there in Washington, D.C. White concrete, they're doing an okay job, but it's really the four inch of space in the garden. This will be all green gardens between these pavilions. So now they, they realize that it's going to be a great building. This is the Institute for Contemporary Art in <laughs> Richmond, Virginia. That's the social space, which is the entrance. You can enter it from the university side on the left or the street side on the right. And that's a sketch. This was also a bit of a competition. That's a sketch from the presentation of the fourth gallery, which is up above. And that's the realization. So I, I, I work with a concept that drives the design, um, and then work, work with the space in perspective, and then make the plans. I never start with the plans. Sometimes I start with a section. But plans to me are the, just not the, right, not the right beginning point for, uh, for a piece of architecture. We work with the spaces. This is a very controversial city. Richmond, Virginia is where the last battle of the Civil War in America, where the, some people there still fly the Confederate flag. So I was very happy to see that the building is being well received. It's the corner of the university campus, so the university gave them land. So it m it's a bridge between the community and the university. There's the street side, which, which demonstrates a kind of action, the, the, the auditorium on the left, the vertical gallery on the right, and then we have this concept of forking time, this notion, all the galleries kind of fork out, and it's notion that there used to be a grand narrative in art. During, during the 20s, the, uh, during the 30s, surrealism in Paris, during, during the 50s, abstract expressionism in New York, Jackson Pollock, Franz Klein, there was a grand narrative in other arts and then maybe even, you say, in the 70s, the mid-70s, conceptual art. But today, there's no grand narrative. Bryce Martin can make his paintings. Um, Doug Atkin can do his videos. Richard Serra can make his sculpture. So the idea is this notion of forking time. It was also inspired by uh, Borges, the Garden of Forking Paths. And that's the plane of the present where the forking time meets the, the city, the dynamics of the city. There's a new film on the building that's going to come out, I think, in about two weeks. There's where you see the galleries coming together. That was the opening. Uh, 
I don't think this little, yes it does. And this is my daughter giving me a crit. She says, she's two and a half years old and she says, I'm the boss. So I'm very, this is, I think, our best recent work. It, it took a long time, but it's, it's, very, it's very exciting for what it will do to that community. And also we just broke ground on a Franklin and Marshall College, an art school in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. And it used to be a brick building sitting on the ground, very horizontal. They need to double the size. So we took the inspiration that this campus has the oldest trees in the, in the area. It's a kind of arboretum of trees. Some of them are three feet in diameter. So we took the inspiration of the circumference of the trees, those diameters, making concave shape, and then rise the building up almost like a kite, Ben Franklin's kite, Franklin Marshall University. So that's the galleries down below, and you can see right through to the park, and then the studio spaces for painting and sculpture up above. So every, every studio has operable glass and skylight, and some test drawings. And this is in Iowa City, the University of Iowa. We, 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 we made the building in 2007 on the left, and there was a flood, and therefore we had to make a new building. That was also a competition, which we won. And that was a struggle, because when you make a building that's pretty good, and you have to come back and add another building that's twice the size right next to it, you, as an architect, you have a kind of crisis, because you say, if it isn't, better than what I did before, they are going to say, I'm losing it, right? No, it's, it was, I did like 30 designs. I worked on the, we worked on the design for six months. And we came with a simple concept. The first building was planar and steel. So this, we said, will be concrete and volumetric. And this notion of light, vertical porosity, I said it could be a laminar section where the, where the certain sections of the building kind of slide, and they then animate these light, centers. It's also a building that complements the campus because it creates a campus quadrangle. So that was the concept drawing. Multiple centers of light, and when you have that added to the laminar shift, you get some very interesting results. And that's the big, let's say, social condenser space at the center, because when they walk into campus, they walk through this space. So all people of the campus get to see this. I think that was a little video, but it doesn't play. That's all right. That was the opening where the president said, this is the most interesting building on our campus. And it's a quite a big campus. This is recently opened uh, in London, the Maggie Center. If you get to London, please visit. It's based on the notion of a thing within a thing within a thing, a bamboo inner layer, the structural concrete like a hand, and new notation embedded in the glass. This, this is at St. Bart's, the oldest hospital in the United Kingdom, but it was also the next to St. Bart's Cathedral, which dates back to monks before musical notation, where they, they made a thing called shape notes. And noom, which is a Greek word, means breath of life. So this is about people with terminal cancer. This is where they can come. I don't know if you know about the Maggie's centers. There's something like 12 of them. Um, Zaha did one. Rem did one. There's there, it was an honor to be invited. Charles Jenks invited us to do this. But this is the most difficult because it was in the middle of London, and it's the only vertical Maggie's center. And that was this notion of the new notation embedded in a musical staff around the building. That's from the 12th century. And there is a 1743 listed James Gibbs building that we're up against. So that was, that was, I think I had, I don't know, 30 presentations to various city authorities. And, but it got opened last year, and it was really beautiful. All natural bamboo. Uh, concrete is exposed structure. Stainless steel staff that wraps, and then the, the coins of the James Gibbs building uh, are exposed, so it, it's, it's 
bringing back to life the 1743 building. And it changes at night. It's, it's, there you see all the, all the materials are exposed. This is a good building for students to visit because it's only 6,000 square feet. And it's everything that I'd like to say is important in architecture. That is natural light. It's a place of social responsibility. It's trying for terminal can cancer people to give them an uplift. But it, it, in the details, every material is its own, let's say, expression. And you know, the structure is exposed, but it's not over-celebrated. It's like a hand. The glass, this is a new kind of a glass that we invented by Okalux, the company Okalux, which is a super insulating glass. And we figured out how to embed a in between two layers of Okalux, a thin colored film. So in a way, it's a new kind of stained glass that we invented for the project. And then during the day, it's very subtle. It doesn't glow. At night, it glows. So it, it's glowing on the inside during the day, and therefore, it's more respectful to the James Gibbs building. But at night, it glows like an inviting lantern. And I'm doing a project in Africa because I had a great client in Korea that's philanthropic, and he's contributing. He had a shipping company. I think as architects, you know, we have to do what comes to us, uh, a commission to do a rich person's villa. That's what it was in Korea. It was a gallery. It's called the Dayang uh, Gallery, and it was for the Mr. Chung, who's a shipping. He owned this gigantic uh, shipping company worldwide. And at 65, he said, I'm finished, he sold the company, and he formed this thing called the Miracle of Africa Foundation. And he's building a campus. I've never been to Africa. It was scary. That's me landing at the airport. But if you know, Malawi is one of the poorest countries on the planet. There's the, the, the people of Malawi make less than a dollar a day, average. And it's just a lesson that this earth is a globe and we all inhabit it together. I made this drawing from, uh, inspired from a Malawi artist who does these batik with these different African colors. And I said, ah, that could be a campus plan. There's our library in the center. And then this won a bunch of awards in progressive architecture and magazine. But it's really, it's me trying to make a connection to that site and to that culture. And then, I said to Matthias Schuler, who uh, he does all of our ener energy work. We, we're always trying to do net zero as we as close as we can. And I said, if if I'm building in Malawi, you know, I I, I think the problem is going to be energy. You know, they have a problem. They d have de deforestation problem. The the they they burn uh, every little scrap of wood so that they can heat their little stoves. Um, and you know, so solar energy is something we could bring. And so we. We, I said, give me the section that it would be the maximum natural light on the inside of a library and the maximum solar exposure for the PVs on the roof. And that was the section. Of course, I didn't stop with the section. I said, I imagine the wind blowing across the tundra uh, in the field and there would be a ripple that would then give you orientation on the space. And that's... That's the section, that's the basic idea, the, the natural light and the electric power. And now the building is starting construction next month. And there's a photo montage. They built a lake there, so that's part of the campus plan. And uh, this will be the first building. And then we're building a second building, so we'll already have a basic campus. We'll have a space, a central space. And this will have classrooms, cafeteria, some dormitory rooms. Oops, I want this to play. Can we get this? Can you get this? Can you make this play? Anyway. Oh. <laughs> this is a welcome dance. Look at, look at these costumes. This is natural. <laughs> anyway. I think it's very important to, to try to understand other places thoroughly, and, and making a contribution there is really exciting. I should stop now, because I think I have too many projects, and it's already too late. Maybe I won't show this. I'll just say that this was a competition where 
again, we broke the rules. They said, we want to build a seven-story parking garage. And then you can do this museum, which is on the right-hand side, because that was on a church parking lot. They have to build a garage first. And we said, uh-uh, I don't think you should build a seven-story park garage. We said, what you ought to do is tear down the existing uh, school and double the size, and then you can put a layer of parking underneath the whole site. So, and there's the building, the, the main museum building that, that has natural light as its driving force. And there you see this whole campus. So uh, all the other competitors did a seven-story parking garage. Tom Main really wanted to win this. And when I won, he said, Stephen, I couldn't get out of bed for a day. He was really upset. He's a close friend. Anyway, you see the new Glasshouse School on the left, the new extension of the Noguchi Sculpture Garden, the new building in the middle. That's Mises' only building. On the right-hand side is Mises' only building of a museum in, in um, America. And there's this building is going to open in a year and a half. That's the social condenser space at the center of it. This is the social condenser space of the of the school, the glass cell school. And we built this. We had to build this building for like 550 a square foot. So this is made out of the structure. Those are precast concrete panels. The structure, and then there's a big space at the at the corner of the L that becomes a place where they can put their sculptures, their their artwork. There's Willard Holmes, the directing of the, of the works. This is the opening, which was last month. And the school is already in, in action. And that's the concrete that's sandblasted. It was made in Waco, Texas. So those, those are the structural walls that you're looking at. And there's nothing on the inside. So it's, a, it's just a building, a very raw building for a school, for an art school at night. And there's tests for the museum building, which is going to be sheathed in what I call a cold jacket. That's the sun in Texas. It's very hot, so when the sun shines on these half circles of glass, by the chimney effect, it'll draw 90% of the solar gain off the building, but it'll also bring light inside. And I'm just ending with this competition in Dublin for the University College Creative Center of Design which will be decided on August 7th. Watch the internet. Everybody watch. And I, I had this, what I really like this project because this is where James Joyce went to school. And James Joyce, you know, revolutionized literature with stream of consciousness, with the, w with the use of the word. So I have you know, words from James Joyce floating around in the sky and the other thing, the other link I made to the site was to the Giant's Causeway, which is these amazing basalt forms. I don't know if anybody's been there, but it's an amazing place. Um, 60 million year old geometry. So, and then we had to do a campus master plan, and I made a very simple seven quadrangles. I really think a quadrangle, I mean, this is almost a quadrangle. This space is almost like a quadrangle. That a campus needs to form spaces, the buildings need to form spaces and not be objects. And that's the main entrance. So they wanted an iconic building. That was part of the brief. We want an entrance. We want to mark our campus. We want an icon. So I said, OK. In fact, all the other entries make vertical buildings because you could go up as high. So they wanted to be able to see the building from the, the Dublin Bay. And I said, let's keep the horizontal organization of the school and make the vertical icon just a piece. So there you see the circulation. And I tilt the vertical icon at 23 degrees, which is the tilt of the axis of the Earth. And there's some, some conference rooms, but at the very top, there's a telescope uh, where you can view the cosmos. And nowadays, you can get enormously high-powered telescopes for very little, and they can run on a GPS so you can find planets. It's really an interesting moment in technology. And there it is from the highway. Anyway, this is the talk. Those are the chapters. and. Uh, Anyway, if we have questions, we can have, have questions. Thank you.